The Tubbyland Archives Act 1 is the first part of a multiple part FNAF fan game series that released 8 months ago. The game was developed by Clicky Code and is a remake of the iconic fan game Five Nights at Tubbyland, which was released over 7 years ago. Just by comparing the two games game jolt pages, we can see how much the developer has improved over the 7 years since the release of the original title. Each render shared on the game jolt page showcases the insanely high detailed animatronics we will be facing. As well as well as the horrifying environments the game takes place in, and even some hints towards the game's lore. But is the game actually good? Well, that is what I'm here to find out today. So if you're just as curious as me, then join me as we do a deep dive into the Tubbyland Archives Act 1 to see if the remake is really all that good. Before that though, today's video is sponsored by Dead by Daylight Mobile. Dead by Daylight Mobile is the official mobile version of the iconic horror game Dead by Daylight. As we all know, Dead by Daylight is the originator of the 4 vs 1 asymmetrical genre, and Dead by Daylight Mobile restores this authentic gameplay. In Dead by Daylight Mobile, 4 players try to survive while 1 player attempts to kill them all. While playing as a survivor, you will experience desperate pursuit, hiding, and survival in dead end situations, so it's best to cooperate with your fellow survivors if you plan on making it out alive. The killer on the other hand will experience brilliant kills, gore, and absolute power. Dead by Daylight Mobile has so many variables at play which keeps the game fresh every single time. Also thanks to the game's dynamic shading and lighting, along with its complete visual overhaul of every character and map, the environments feel more authentic and real than ever before. The atmosphere and surroundings along with the operation and soundtrack work to bring true feelings of horror to every single player. On top of that, as a limited time collaboration from March 15th, 2023, Sadako, the vengeful spirit from the Japanese horror novel The Ring and the official film adaptation, joins Dead by Daylight Mobile as a brand new killer. The limited Sadako outfit Sleeping Blossom will only be available from March 15th to the 28th. Download Dead by Daylight Mobile using my link in the description. Thank you so much to Dead by Daylight Mobile for sponsoring today's video. As soon as we open up the game, we get one of the coolest menus I've ever seen in a FNAF fan game. We see a flashlight move around the room, giving us a short glimpse at the four Teletubbies we will be facing before the title screen appears. This is just such a cool way to give us a little tease of what's to come later in the game. After actually pressing new game, we are brought to an opening cinematic. The cinematic shows us multiple different shots of the establishment as the CEO talks to us on the phone. He informs us that we got the job for Nightwatch. He tells us that we can clock in on Monday where we will get our uniform and other needed supplies. And as he's explaining this to us, the visuals get increasingly more disturbing, showcasing to us the worn down withered versions of the Teletubby robots, ending with a shot of the green Teletubby staring directly at the camera. After this, we spawn into our office, and to make things easier to understand, I'll go ahead and explain everything we have at our disposal. So in our office, we have an open doorway to our left and in front of us, neither of which we can close. And on our right, we also have a curtain which we can hide in. This will come in handy later. Anyways, on our far left, we also have access to a camera. These cameras are extremely dark and need to be lit up by a flashlight in order to see the animatronics. We don't lose any power for having the camera open, but we do need to watch out on our flashlight battery. We also have a reboot button which will reboot any cameras that happen to randomly shut off during the night. And trust me, during the later nights, you will be using this a lot. Finally, we have a speaker system. Very very similar to FNAF 3, we can click this button to play a sound in one of the rooms. This will attract the Teletubbies into the room you play the sound in as long as they are in a room next to that one. You aren't able to spam this however as it needs to regenerate after every single use. During night 1, our phone guy, who is also an employee at Tubbyland, calls in to let us know that the previous employee left. He then tells us more generic phone guy things before letting us know that the red one has been reactivated recently. He also informs us that she has no eyes, so we can use our intercom system to keep her away from our office. So yeah, pretty straightforward. For night 1, we just need to continue using our intercom system to make sure the red Teletubby stays away from our office. This is very easy to do, but trust me, this game gets hard fast. After night 1 concludes, we load into our very first post night mini game. This one has us controlling the green Teletubby, also known as Dipsy. We are set free in the Tubbyland establishment and are told by a text prompt to find 
behind a new new. New new for you guys who have never seen the show is the blue vacuum looking creature. Yeah, this thing always gave me weird vibes as a kid. It's honestly no surprise Teletubbies ended up as a FNAF fan game cause just look how creepy these characters are. Tangent aside though, after going from room to room in this very well put together and polished minigame section, we eventually stumble across new new. For night one they are seen deactivated in a random corner of the building. After approaching new new however, we actually wake them before the mini game concludes. After waking up new new, our second night begins and this is where the game's difficulty really starts picking up. Right away our phone guy calls us informing us that two new animatronics have been activated. These being the one without the head and new new, the one we just awakened. The phone guy informs us that the one without the head is extremely hostile and will not be fooled by the intercom system. He then tells us that our best way of defending against this Teletubby is to simply stay out of view if she gets too close. This means that we need to monitor her on the cameras, however unlike the red Teletubby we can actually see this one without the lights on. Very similar to Freddy in FNAF 1, this Teletubby's eyes glow, so there is no need to flash the light in order to find her. There are two different cameras that will lead into the two doors doors in our office. If we see the Teletubby at one of these cameras before disappearing, this means we have a short window to hide in our curtain before we are killed. When you hide, you also get these really sick and terrifying animations where the yellow Teletubby actually walks into the room, which is just such a neat addition. I always love when 2D FNAF fan games incorporate animation in this way. It helps sell the game as being more than just a sequence of PNGs and is also really terrifying the first couple times around. As for the second enemy we must face in night 2, the vacuum cleaner, the phone guy doesn't really tell us much about him. He claims the CEO himself worked on him and that his only piece of advice is to not stay in the room with him for too long. What this is actually referring to is if we stay behind the curtains too long during the night, the vacuum will actually kill us. So Nunu is not really a threat, but more of a way to prevent us from camping behind the curtain. Now on paper this night doesn't sound too bad at all, just monitor the red and yellow Teletubbies and don't stay in the curtain for too long. I mean, how hard could it possibly be? Well, in actual practice, this night was very hard to get a grasp of at first. The mechanic of knowing when the yellow Teletubby is going to come into your office is very confusing at first and will take a lot of trial and error before you get adjusted to it. Once you do have a full understanding of how each of these two animatronics function though, this night can be beaten pretty easily. After night 2 concludes, we load back into the minigame section and are once again tasked with finding Nunu. Only this time we are playing as the red Teletubby, also known as Poe. Just like last time we roam around the same building, searching through various different rooms before eventually finding Nunu, who this time is seen refilling the custard machine. Now these mini games may seem like they are going nowhere, but just stick with it, it gets more interesting later. For night 3 we once again are introduced to another enemy to go up against, and this time it's the purple Teletubby. The phone guy informs us that the purple one will begin moving and also tells us that it has no legs, meaning this one will be crawling towards us, which is absolutely terrifying. It really reminds me of Five Nights at Chuck E. Cheese Remastered and how the animatronics in that game also crawl towards you. The phone guy then tells us that this purple Teletubby does not like high pitched sounds, so flashing our light on them and the cameras will scare them away. After this, the phone guy lets us know that he is getting a really weird vibe from the place. Hmm, I wonder why. And then he tells us that he's going to have a look around the files before ending the call. Night 3's difficulty compared to the first two is quite the leap. This night took me a long time to beat. In nights 1 and 2 it was quite easy to stay on top of managing everything because there was no need to search the cameras where we knew the yellow and red Teletubbies wouldn't go. But now, thanks to the newly introduced purple one, we must frequently scan the other cameras to make sure they aren't approaching our office. This also means we will be rebooting the cameras a lot more which can cost us precious seconds in our run. Sometimes it can even cost you enough time to get you killed if you haven't checked on Poe or Lala in a while. By the way, Lala is the yellow one, I don't know if I stated that earlier. I'm not really sure how to explain it properly, it's just one of those things you need to play for yourself, but the whole night has this sort of balance to it where your time is constantly occupied by fending off one animatronic at a time, and it becomes kind of this juggling act of making sure everyone is where they need to be. Because of this, it is very easy to slip up and actually forget 
forget which animatronic you are meant to check on, as your order of checking on them can be interrupted by so many random things happening. Even though this one did take me a little while, this is far from the hardest night in the game. After night 3, this time we take control of Lala, the headless Teletubby, and once again have to find the vacuum. We do our usual search around the building, and this time see Nunu taking out the trash. Nothing too out of the ordinary. For night 4, right away our phone guy wastes no time informing us what's going on with the robots. He tells us that after looking at the files, he discovered some crazy things, and tells us that his suspicions were true, but doesn't elaborate further as he's scared the CEO could be listening in on the phone calls. After telling us that, he remembers to inform us about the final robot introduced to this game, this being the green Teletubby aka Dipsy. The only recommendation our phone guy has for us to deal with Dipsy is to stay out of view. We also learn that one of Dipsy's eyes is screwed up, but other than that we are once again left to figure out how to deal with this animatronic. Before finishing the call however, the phone guy is interrupted by the CEO, who seems to be suspicious of the phone guy after discovering some of the files were misplaced. The phone guy tells the CEO that it wasn't him, but it seems like he doesn't trust him. He then out of nowhere asks him to come in tomorrow night, as he needs him to check on something. Hmm, sounds pretty suspicious to me. Soon after that, Night Force phone call concludes and we are left on our own to now face off against all four Teletubbies. This night is once again very hard and now not only do we need to juggle the three previous robots but now we also need to worry about Dipsy. You will be alerted that Dipsy has appeared by a sound cue that will play of somebody laughing. After this occurs you will be able to see Dipsy's one eye peeking through the darkness of the hall in front of you. If this happens that means that Dipsy is in their first stage. From here they are able to move closer step by step. You must listen for every time there is a sound cue and once you see Dipsy almost fully entered into your room, that is when you need to hide. There is no animation like there was for Lala though, so once you're behind the curtain, you will need to listen out for a laugh which indicates Dipsy has left. Night 4 took me over an hour to beat. Not only does everything need to be executed perfectly, but RNG also needs to be on your side in many situations. I think that this is actually a good spot for me to talk about the game's difficulty, because in my opinion, this game is way too hard. One issue I think a lot of fan games fall under is balancing the gameplay perfectly. The game is meant to scare us, however when it's so difficult that you'll be playing over and over and over, it really quickly stops being scary and instead just turns into pure rage every single time you die. Which is what was happening to me during this stage of the game. I think this game has so many cool aspects about it and it really could have been a horrifying experience, but the number one thing holding it back is just how hard it is. Is. I don't think many players will stick around to complete the entire game, as even me, who went into the game planning on making a video about it, almost quit multiple times. That's how hard it really is. I'll go as far as to say that this game is harder than Endless Inside and Night 6 of SCP The Endurance. Anyways, after finally beating Night 4, we load back into our minigame section, this time taking control of Tinky Winky. This one is actually really funny because we get to see Tinky Winky crawl around as we search for Nunu. What's not so funny though is when we actually find him and see this. Nunu cleaning up a spill. I wonder whose blood that could be. Okay, so for night 5. As soon as the night starts, we get a call from our phone guy once again, who this time can be heard listening. He tells us he is currently hiding and says that the CEO telling him to come was a death trap. He tells us he found a box in the party hall that smells pretty awful and says the robots were in there with it. Then before the phone guy can get anything else out, this happens. Rest in peace to the phone guy, he was a real one. As for the actual gameplay during night 5, it is the exact same as night 4, only with more difficult AI. During this night, it was unbelievably hard to balance all of the animatronics. It was a constant battle with RNG and my reaction time, and it took me over an hour to beat, but eventually I did it. However, there was just one small problem. So after beating night 5, we once again load into the minigame section and are told to find Nunu. We roam around for a little bit 
bit before stumbling across what appears to be our phone guy trying to make his last escape from the vacuum before it slowly moves closer and closer and presumably kills him. After this, we get our paycheck for $248. But after this, this is where the issue arises. No, I can't leave now. I can't. I just listened to someone getting murdered. They're responsible. I can't let them get away with this. I have to go back. I have to. Maybe he's still alive. But if not, I can't let his death be in vain. Maybe those documents he mentioned are still there. I might be able to use those. It's worth a shot. What's one more night gonna hurt? Yeah. So if night 5 wasn't hard enough, there is a sixth night to this game. And I'm just gonna keep it completely real with you guys, I cannot beat it. I spent countless hours attempting it on my own, even asked a fellow YouTuber who beat the game for any tips, watched other people's playthroughs, and I truly just can't get through it. Now if this was just an extra night, this wouldn't be too much of a problem for me, but unlike other FNAF fan games, Night 6 actually unlocks extra story details. So I'm gonna have to use another creator's footage so that way we can still see the ending. If you guys are the type to take on these insane FNAF challenges, please let me know if you're able to beat this night, because in my opinion, it's it's bordering on impossible. I seriously have no idea how anyone was able to get through this. Anyways, after completing Night 6 by some absolute miracle, we load into the minigame as our actual protagonist. This time the building is dark and our surroundings are only illuminated by a small light. We need to roam around the building collecting 10 files, all while being hunted by the 4 Teletubbies. From what I've seen in the gameplay, it appears this minigame you can actually fail, so it will take you a couple of attempts to get through. Luckily, it doesn't set you back to the beginning of the night though, because that would just be pure evil. Anyways, after collecting the 10 files, the minigame concludes, and the game ends, granting us one pinwheel. Yeah, so turns out you actually don't even get that much extra lore, which is pretty insane considering how hard Night 6 really is. After this, we are able to view the extras menu, which actually has a lot of really cool things to see here, as well as play the custom night, which you will absolutely not catch me playing. This game is way too hard. Overall, I would say that the Tubbyland Archives Act 1 is a fantastic fan game that is only held back by the balancing. The graphics and atmosphere is definitely up there with the best FNAF fan games. Every character has a horrifying and unique design that separates them from each other, the building feels like a real place and is also very interesting to explore, and all of the jump scares and animation work tie the whole thing together perfectly to make it feel more real than if those elements weren't there. The story of the game also, while simple, was pretty engaging. I actually prefer when fan games follow a simple narrative that doesn't try to dump too much exposition on the player and instead just serves as context for each night of the game. The mini games and calls between each night were also an amazing addition as they actually give the player a reason to get through the entire game. All of the voice actors did an amazing job selling their roles, none of it felt forced and you could tell that they actually put real effort into it. So yeah, the only thing really holding this game back is the sheer difficulty of it. Unfortunately regardless of how amazing this game is, most casual players are not going to be able to experience it, which is just such a shame. I'm all for making fan games difficult, that way they can be rewarding to complete, but this game just takes it way too far in my opinion. Let me know what you guys thought of this game though. Did you like it? Did you not like it? Is it being so hard just a skill issue? Let me know down below in the comments. Also let me know if you guys want to see Act 2 get covered on the channel whenever that releases. Anyways with that being said, I hope you guys all enjoyed the video and I will see you all in the next one. Peace.